so um, I just wanted to finish up uh, that last bit of discussion uh, we were uh, at last time and give you a couple of examples and then pretty much summarize uh, what uh, uh, we managed to cover in this course. Uh, so, <coughs> uh, so, so what we were, uh, uh, I, I kind of tried to cover uh, um, some aspects of uh, uh, the kinetics and thermodynamics of, uh, of uh, growth processes. Uh, so what I'll uh, do is a, a, a typical uh, a growth process tip, uh, of, of a compound semiconductor would involve your semiconductor crystal, that's uh, um, gallium arsenide or any of those materials. And uh, uh, let's say uh, there are um, uh, atoms of type, uh, you know, atoms of type B that are bonded to each other and then... Uh, and so on, and and then there's a vapor of type A. Uh, let's say you're growing, trying to grow germanium on silicon or some other material on some doing heteroepitaxy, or it could be also the same type. But now you have a vapor, right? Which is uh, uh, you know atoms moving around. It's a gas, and this is a solid. And uh, what we were, uh, what the thermodynamics aspect of it here is saying is is a. Uh, 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 that uh, a certain fraction of these A atoms or molecules will adsorb uh, to the surface and uh, they will not be chemically bonded yet but uh, they'll float around on the surface and uh, uh, and there's a certain equilibrium uh, uh, composition or mon of coverage or equilibrium fraction of coverage so if I'm looking at it from the surface uh, you have these uh, uh, lattice sites uh, uh, from the surface uh, and uh, uh, each of them for example can potentially form a bond and uh, and uh, uh, what fraction of them have an atom like that sitting on it and that's that's uh, the equilibrium uh, coverage and uh, that clearly depends on uh, on the pressure of this vapor and the temperature of that vapor as well. Right? So, so it's, it's very clear that it, it must depend on the two. And, uh, uh, and the thermodynamic aspect of it, this is very standard. Uh, hopefully, you have seen it in a few courses. Uh, but that equilibrium uh, coverage is, uh, uh, you know, once you go through um, m m most of the arguments, uh, uh, and uh, um, okay, so, so it starts by saying that the free energy of uh, uh, forming a, a layer of, uh, of this sort or this is this layer is in equilibrium with the vapor and the free energy is of the uh, of the form it depends on the pressure and the temperature right? that's what we are trying to find out what's the relation of pressure and temperature and that uh, will be uh, of, of the form uh, uh, any energy is with respect to something so let's say we are looking at the free energy with respect to the pressure at a certain uh, pressure and we are varying the temperature then it would look uh, something like this so so it increases logarithmically with pressure and linearly with temperature so, right, so, so uh, and uh, uh, this is very very similar to uh, if you're looking at doping densities things like that if you look at activation of electrons in a band uh, here you have n electron density. So here pressure is a measure of the atom atomic density of in in the gas, right? So so it's very similar. If you look at this, you know you have this n c k t log n over n c s and all that. It's very similar to that. Right? So so uh, uh, the uh, and then uh, so that's the kind of the free energy, and uh, you go through uh, again uh, uh, the the uh, you know you have the entropy aspect to it if your coverage is theta equilibrium we know we will have uh, entropy term that will look like then theta 1 minus theta then 1 minus theta right so you take all the uh, enthalpy terms you know the entropy terms uh, take u minus ts and you uh, uh, find the minima and that's the relation you get after you find the minima so this is this is kind of a a nice uh, uh, relation that will give you what is your uh, equilibrium um, coverage on the surface as a function of the pressure P and the temperature T. 
So, so this relation gives you that. Uh, and uh, the way it comes out in the end, it's a transcendental form. It it's, doesn't have a clear analytical solution. Uh, but obviously, you can plot it and find out the dependence on pressure and temperature, right? So uh, it depends on two energy scales. One is this enthalpy uh, term, and there's a desorption energy uh, term. Uh, so uh, free energy for you know getting desorbed. The the energy scale, which is kind of the uh, uh, remember the reason why it, it will uh, uh, adsorb to the surface in the first place is because you have a uh, a potential that looks something like that, right? And, and, and there's a certain energy scale associated with the atom landing on the surface rather than going out. So there are these couple of energy scale, two energy scales to be precise. This uh, omega, which is the enthalpy related term, chemical term, and this is more, you know, uh, uh, the uh, potential um, for capturing, for the atom getting captured on the surface. So with these two energy scales, you can uh, write down now the uh, uh, theta equilibrium as a function of pressure and a function of temperature. If you do that, uh, and let's say, for argument's sake, uh, uh, this enthalpy of formation is called a regular solution and it's zero, let's say for argument's sake initially. Uh, the reason I was saying this is a transcendental equation, I think you realize right away, is because this theta is also sitting in the exponential, in addition to being out here. So, uh, but the, if you take this omega to be zero, which is true for certain sorts of uh, chemical species, uh, then, uh, then you get analytical form. It's a very standard form, right? Uh, you get theta over one minus theta is equal to that, and and the equilibrium theta then becomes uh, basically it's the pressure over the pressure plus uh, you know this uh, reference pressure that you are choosing minus a certain desorption uh, ent uh, enthal free energy over kT. So it, it, this is a, a uh, you, if you take this, it lo looks like pressure over pressure plus some some other thing here. There's no, you know, this pressure term here, but there's one over temperature exponential uh, temperature. And if you take this and make a plot of it, I think you, you kind of uh, can imagine it. It will, uh, if I have pressure here and I have theta equilibrium, right? So for uh, 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 it starts from zero, right? When there's no pressure, there's nothing to deposit, there's nothing to cover, right? So theta is zero, and it starts linearly, uh, and then uh, it starts linearly, and then it, it, it starts saturating. Right? Sorry, it's, it's linear, and then saturates, and and this crossover point uh, is is uh, is basically p naught e to the power minus this this option over kt, right? So that's that's this term, right? Uh, right? And, and and what it's basically saying is uh, um, you you will uh, obviously the maximum theta you can have is one, right? It's the all sides are covered, uh, but uh, this this range o o over which if you keep increasing the pressure after that you don't get any more coverage, you know? and and uh, and this point actually depends exponentially on temperature too. So you can shift it, shift this point you know, this line that way or that way by changing the temperature, uh, right? Uh, uh, temperature of the vapor here. So, um, and then the, this is uh, somewhat of a standard curve. Uh, does anybody know it has a name? Uh, so this is a curve at a fixed temperature. It's fixed temperature and then you change the temperature, this will change a little bit, right? Anybody knows what, who kind of found this for the first time? That's right. This is called the Langmuir isotherm uh, after Langmuir, who is uh, obviously a very famous scientist, also a Nobel, Nobel Prize winner. Uh, and this is the Langmuir isotherm. And uh, uh, those of you who actually might have taken device courses, actually we did some devices in this course as well. We'll realize that this looks very much like, you know, the IV curve of a transistor, and it's not a big surprise actually because. Uh, um, uh, it has a similar, uh, you know, all, all these things all carry over from the transistors. So current versus voltage, it looks similar. You know, beyond a certain voltage, you can't increase the current anymore, and you reach saturation current, similar. So, yeah. uh, and uh, so that's the Langmuir isotherm, and uh, it's basically giving you uh, a good feel for what is theta equilibrium versus pressure, and uh, 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 when you are doing epitaxial growth, uh, we change, for example, the pressure 
uh, by changing you know the flux of atoms that uh, uh, we, we, we have incident on the surface and so on uh, so isotherm is when you have fixed temperature and obviously you can draw an language isobar which will be fixed pressure at a variable temperature too so, so, okay. and temperature dependence will be exponential pressure dependence is linear uh, linear uh, within, within this window as you can see so, yeah. okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay so so that part is uh, uh, the thermodynamic part and uh, uh, we can talk a little bit about the kinetic part here as well. Uh, so as the atoms are landing uh, on the surface, uh, uh, we, uh, we know that at equilibrium, the amount that lands and gets you know, adsorbed on the surface is equal to the amount that goes out back, right? that bounces back. So at equilibrium, the two, two processes exactly balance each other. Therefore, we can uh, write down that the uh, rate at which Dis the atoms are dissolving from the surface is uh, 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 actually we, 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 we know that the rate at which they're dissolving is equal to the rate at which they're adsorbing and we have already found the impinge uh, the rate at which they impinge on the surface right the rate at which we had found they impinge on the surface and you're doing that also in your assignment is pressure over 2 pi mass of the atoms times kt right? where k is the Boltzmann constant there, right? Now, uh, that would be uh, the uh, rate of atoms incident per uh, centimeter square per second, and then uh, if you want to find out what's the total uh, uh, rate at which just one site, you know, just one atomic site here uh, is receiving atoms from the vapor, right, at which they're landing, uh, we can always find what is the uh, uh, area of that atomic site, uh, of that lattice site, area corresponding to that lattice site. That's pretty easy, right? It's kind of the unit cell dimension. And we, let's call that lambda squared. Lambda is can maybe a lattice constant, for example, right? So we multiply by that to get not in atoms per centimeter square, but basically atoms per second now, right? per lattice site, how many atoms per second. So. And then uh, uh, we are actually going to find uh, uh, the uh, so n amount of atoms that are actually adsorbed are ones that land here and stay here, don't go back. Right? So that part of it uh, is, is uh, labeled, or, or we call it a sticking coefficient, which is obviously uh, going to depend on theta and temperature. So you know, if you land there, what's the probability that you stick there and uh, 1 minus that is probability of going back right so so that's a, a fa number between 0 and 1 so sticking coefficient is uh, uh, built into this uh, and uh, it tells you the probability that the atom actually sticks to the crystal and doesn't go back into the vapor again right? so 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 with that will tell you uh, at uh, the rate at which stuff is going into into each lattice site you know uh, atoms rate at which uh, uh, each lattice site is receiving atoms uh, from the vapor. Right? So, so that's, that's the net rate. Right? So, but, sorry? Good point. So, yeah, I'm going to, so the reason I'm, yeah, we can write it as adsorption. That's correct, actually. Adsorption, yeah. But the thing is, at equilibrium, they're the same. Yeah, but that's right. Yeah, so this is the adsorption rate, correct, of atoms landing on the site. And, uh, uh, <clears throat> And uh, 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 okay, so let me write that. So that is equal to J desorption on, at equilibrium. Right? That part we are clear. And uh, uh, now uh, we just look at that expression and we realize that we, we need to know the pressure and uh, obviously the sticking coefficient. Uh, uh, and the rest of it we, we know, right? Lambda is a lattice site, uh, you know, area of a lattice site, mass of the atoms, temperature, we know those things. So uh, uh, the pressure, you get it from here. Right. That, that's where you get the pressure from. Uh, and uh, uh, so you, ideally, you'd like to solve the whole big equation here and write the pressure in terms of this. In fact, that's what is, is done here. Uh, I'm not going to kind of try to rewrite it. But uh, 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 so the pressure here would be you know, theta over minus theta, exponential this thing, and all that, e to the power minus that. You know. So that's so you can transfer that pressure term 
from here and you get p naught lambda square s you get theta one minus theta e to the power this thing e to the power minus this uh, disruption uh, disruption so I think that's a typo that shouldn't be j that should be g g is the en free energy the disruption yeah. so uh, uh, so now you see that uh, uh, disruption rate is is also related to uh, uh, the uh, rate of change of theta so if you want to ask how, at what rate is my coverage increasing or decreasing now at in, in uh, kinetically with time so theta is the coverage now we want to find what is d theta over dt right? what's the rate at which they uh, at which they're changing what, what's the rate and that clearly is is uh, is a non-equilibrium we're, we're asking this as a non-equilibrium rate equation so d theta by dt will obviously now be the uh, rate at which theta can increase is uh, a rate at which uh, things are adsorbing minus rate at which atoms are desorbing, right? That's, that's stuff coming in, minus stuff coming, go, going out, right? And uh, now invoking uh, these two arguments, now we realize that at equilibrium, both of them are the same, but uh, we also realize that at uh, the desorption rate, the desorption rate at which uh, atoms are going to leave are going to be uh, equal to what it, whatever it was at equilibrium because the desorption rate depends on what's happening on the surface. The adsorption rate depends on how much you are dumping in from, this, from there. Right? Does that make sense? It's just like, uh, uh, okay, so, so the desorption rate it does not deviate much from equilibrium. We are now looking at a highly non-equilibrium situation but the desorption rate remains the same as, as, as in equilibrium. But the adsorption rate now depends on, on uh, uh, the non-equilibrium vapor pressure outside. Right? So, so, so that's really the key. Uh, uh, and, 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 and so you get you know, this lambda square S theta. Here you had P naught, which was the equilibrium you know, vapor pressure. Uh, um, at which you kind of, uh, you have found your, uh, you know, from your language isotherm and all that, we can, it's very clear. Uh, that, but then uh, uh, at a non-equilibrium, you, you kind of now change the pressure uh, by changing the flux. You increase the flux of gallium when you're growing gallium oxide or, or uh, you know, change it. And therefore, the amount that's uh, landing on the surface, you can change it by exponentially large amounts, generally. Uh, and, and then therefore, uh, this term out comes out here. And, and you get a rate equation. Basically, you know, it, it, under, under so we can write it as d theta over dt is equal to all this stuff sitting in the front, sticking coefficient over square root of 2 pi mkt. Uh, so that's, that's the constant part. And then you get a differential between you know, the pressure minus essentially p naught. And, and OK, so let's write that down, 1 minus theta. And then you get a e to the power minus theta over kt to a minus desorption over k so, so that get a big term like that and uh, uh, this is a differential equation where what you're trying to find is theta and you know everything else you know so so that's the idea so you have you're controlling everything else you're controlling the pressures temperatures and and these we have done some experiments and you have found them out through some language isotherm measurement or something like that you found them out the language isotherm measurement will give you this delta G, which is the desorption enthalpy. And through other measurements, you can find this omega. So you can find all of them out. Now you can ask, the and the sticking coefficient, uh, generally, uh, I think we were talking yesterday as well, uh, it's clear what it means, but uh, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, it has not been as quantitatively figured out as it should be. Okay, so let's put it that way till now. Okay. But uh, uh, we, uh, that can be measured as well. Uh, um, one of the issues is sticking coefficient is, is a linear term here, but uh, uh, there are some other energies that are exponential terms, and therefore, when you measure an energy and you are off by a couple of tens of MeV, that causes a very large change. It's exponential. So, so that's why you cannot figure out whether it's a difference in this or a difference in this that led to something. So that's a little tricky. Yeah. But probably there are ways to figure that out maybe using read or other methods because 
Uh, yeah, so or dynamics of it and all that. One can potentially figure it out. But you see, this is a differential equation. Uh, d theta over dt is equal to all this stuff on the right. And, uh, uh, but theta enters, uh, typically the sticking coefficient uh, would depend something like this, typically. I mean, not necessarily always true, but uh, some constant times 1 minus theta. It will some typically be like that. And we, when you place them all in, you get, you know, you can try to solve it. Uh, but you see there are, you know, this is a, uh, somewhat of a difficult equation to solve. Um, one can solve it. It's not 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 impossible. At least numerically, one can solve it, you know, relatively easily. But uh, you can make certain approximations here. Uh, one of the nice approximations, again, just what we did for the Langmuir isotherm simplicity. What if uh, uh, this uh, uh, enthalpy term was zero? Then this goes to zero, and for small theta, as you can linearize the equation. You know, so, so you can make it a linear, uh, you know, linearize it. And then uh, it becomes something like this. So, so your this term drops out when omega is zero, and uh, 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 so so it's essentially uh, and your s, if you assume that it varies what, as one minus theta, it cancels the denominator, and you get something like this. And that you can solve. That's a very straightforward equation. It's of the form, you know. Uh, uh, theta dot is a theta plus b. You know that that we know how to solve. And uh, any, any such equation has a characteristic solution that looks like theta at time t will be a theta at time zero times uh, or, or 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 certain theta at time zero plus uh, a certain delta theta e to the power minus t over tau. Right. So so that's how it looks. This is the solution to any such differential equation. Right. First order, so, e to the, so there's a certain time constant associated with it, and that time constant you can pull out by just looking at this equation. You can write it should be you know this whole coefficient times you know p you know this this everything sitting in front of the theta here uh, that goes here. That's the time constant tau, uh, and uh, uh, so in other words, uh, your equilibrium the the if you deviate. Uh, meaning, what what are we physically saying here? So the theta now, as a result of the differential equation, the theta is the equilibrium theta plus any uh, variation from equilibrium. If you pull it out of equilibrium times a certain rate at which it goes back to equilibrium, e to the power minus t over tau, and that tau depends obviously on pressures and and uh, uh, other quantities, uh, uh, to pressure and temperature. Okay. So physically, what does what does this mean? Uh, uh, what, what it really is trying to say is, uh, if I'm trying to do, the, uh, if I'm growing a material, and let's say I uh, I have everything in equilibrium, I'm not growing anything right now, and I suddenly open my gallium shutter and I close it, give a spot, right? So it goes in, and then I close it. Uh, so I turn off the. Uh, so it was sitting at equilibrium before, but now I change it to a certain initial value because I deposited a certain amount. But then I let it go again. I close it. Now it will go back. Try to go back to equilibrium again. How long will it take? Right? And that's what it's telling you there. Right? So, so, and and this you can track very beautifully using read because uh, with read, as you remember, we can track the monolayer coverage and all that sort of thing. How much gallium is there on the surface? And then uh, uh, what you'll see is uh, uh, when you do the this sort of an experiment, the read beam would be initially bright if you're tracking the intensity. And then uh, the moment you open your gallium shutter, it will drop, it will become dim, and then it will recover to that time. And this time scale, this is e to the power minus t over tau. So, so you measure that time scale in, in the read when you track. And then from there, you can back out, because your tau depends on many of these parameters. If you are using gallium, you know the mass of gallium, the temperature at which you, it came from the cell, and, and, and some of these other things, you can figure them out. So, yeah. So that's that's uh, an example of, of uh, 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 kind of the play between some aspects of thermodynamics and some aspects of kinetics. Uh, but obviously, as, as you know, this differential equation, if you have a constant, uh, uh, I mean, this is this is essentially when you turn it off. But uh, if you want to actually solve this equation right away, you can see it can have you know uh, uh, quite a large range of solutions, and uh, one of the um, more interesting solutions is when it's oscillatory because that's exactly the growth process where, where you know theta is increasing, going to zero, increasing, going to zero, and all that oscillatory growth process. So that solution will also come out if you solve this this sort of a differential equation. Okay. 
Uh, okay, so uh, that's uh, a little bit of the uh, 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 science behind behind this. So you, uh, oh, yeah, I said uh, people have actually measured these towers, you know, and this is an example. This is not for a compound semiconductor, but when uh, they're depositing in vacuum uh, CO carbon monoxide molecules, CO molecules on copper one one one, and then uh, uh, by changing the temperatures, this is actually theta of the monolayer coverage, and one over tau, one over tau versus the theta. Uh, from there, by changing the temperature or changing pressures, uh, you can, f you know, these are the solid lines are the plot of uh, that equation and the dots are experimentally measured stuff. So you can kind of extract out very, very, very nice parameters from there. Okay, so uh, what I'll do is uh, give a couple of uh, examples of all this stuff and then uh, we'll kind of end uh, and by discussing uh, what we have kind of covered in this course. So uh, uh, let's look at uh, one, uh, uh, an example, a particular example, which is related to a material, a compound semiconductor material that uh, people started looking at about, uh, about 10 years ago, roughly. Uh, and uh, uh, I think we know now that, uh, 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 so, so uh, let's just, again, uh, look, go back to the uh, boron, uh, Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, right? Okay, so uh, let's just write the, down some of these: indium, boron, in, aluminum, gallium, indium, carbon, okay, nitrogen, phosphorus, oxygen, sulfur, sulfur, right or no? no. And, and so on, right? Uh, so, so uh, we we have talked uh, quite a uh, you know for for many examples, gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, uh, and 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 so on. So um, as you can see, so uh, the in the periodic table, uh, the compound semiconductors we have looked at are kind of either in the middle or a little bit higher. We talked very briefly about some aspects of antimonides, but not too much. Uh, and uh, so uh, the compound circuit has really started around the middle of the periodic table and over time have been going that way and that way. You know, you know investigating, people have been investigating further, you know, much lighter atoms and much heavier atoms too. So much lighter atoms are the wide band gaps. We discussed quite a bit, you know, aluminum nitride, GAN, diamond, or boron nitride, these are, uh, you know, five, four electron volt, three electron volt band gap semiconductors, very light atoms, high thermal conductivity, right? Many of them, not all, but many of them. Uh, uh, but going, uh, going to heavier elements, uh, you get uh, smaller band gaps, and that's, so, so heavier elements will have smaller band gaps. We started the course looking at some of the reasons why and that sort of thing. Uh, and also what happens is you have more and more, uh, uh, as you, uh, why are the atoms heavier? Because the nucleus has, uh, you know, more protons and, uh, uh, more protons and neutrons, right? So, so, um, the he heavier atom has more nucleons, more protons and more neutrons. Uh, and, uh, so the Z or the atomic mass is increasing and, and because you have, uh, more nucleons, what also happens is, is they have, uh, um, much higher, so obviously electron number is always the same as the pr proton number, but as the Z increases, uh, one of the things we didn't quite cover in this course is, is, is that, uh, you know, when you look at the band structure of semiconductors E versus K, uh, so we looked at the conduction band in, in some of the earlier assignments you saw for the valence band, uh, and then we saw that there were uh, three valence bands and one conduction band if you start with four orbitals, right? Four orbitals will lead to four bands, and there were three conduct uh, one conduction band and three valence bands, and we had light hole, heavy hole, and uh, so there is another term which is the split off, okay? Split off, and this split off is because of spin, it's spin orbit splitting, and the idea is very, you know, kind of, the idea is the following, classically at least, and it's actually quantum mechanically the, the same way, uh, the right way to think, that uh, uh, what is spin orbit splitting? It's basically an electron is moving around uh, in an uh, uh, in in the electric field, 
that uh, is, is being radiated out from the nucleus because the nucleus is positively charged. And I, I think you realize that as you go down in the periodic table, you're getting more and more positively charged because you have more po protons in the nucleus. So what happens is that field that's coming out, so obviously there are many electrons here and large part of the field is getting screened. The outermost electrons are not seeing that much, but they're still seeing some, right? I mean, the, the field is still you know, there and the field is higher. And uh, because the electric field is higher uh, and electrons, uh, uh, do you have a, this is very hand wavy, but actually if you do a, a ton of quantum make, you'll get the similar answers. Uh, what is the typical velocity of an electron kind of zipping around the nucleus in a, any, you know, any atom pretty much. Meter to the six. Meter, yeah, 10 to the power 6 roughly. Right, right, exactly right. So it's, it's about one, uh, one hundredth of the speed of light, you know, 1 over 100. Uh, to be more precise, the velocity is uh, what's called the fine structure constant times the speed of light, you know, roughly. Fine structure constant is 1 over 137. 137. Uh, and then followed by, I think, some 0 0.00, which has been really measured to great accuracy using quantum electrodynamics and all that sort of thing. But that's roughly it. So it's about C over 137. And so, uh, and the velocity is actually reasonable, reasonably high. That uh, what happens is the electron moving with a velocity in an electric field effectively sees uh, a magnetic field, which g looks like V cross E over C squared. Right? That's how it looks. The, uh, meaning, uh, I think you can imagine that uh, if, if, if you are sitting on the electron, right, and this zipping around, but if you are sitting on the electron, you see the nucleus going around you, right? right. And, and a nucleus going around you like that is basically a blob of charge that's going around like that. That means you have a current flowing in a loop, right? And I think you know that a current flowing in a loop will create a magnetic field that will look something like mu naught i over you know, 4 pi and all that. Like from a Biot Savalier, you have a loop current and this creates a magnetic field. So, this is the origin of spin orbit splitting. The electron is spinning around in an orbit, but if you sit on the electron, you see the charge is, you know, nuclear charge is spinning around in an orbit that creates a current, and the current is proportional to the charge, which is why it's proportional to the z, or the z, how many nucleons are sitting in the nucleus. Right? This is uh, a hand wavy argument, but actually this, this, uh, uh, this energy scale is not proportional just to z, but to z to the power fourth, roughly, fourth power of the atomic number. And that's what causes a splitting of these. You know, so, so some electrons here see this effect much more strongly, and their energies are split off because of this very strong interaction with the nuclear you know, magnetic field in some sense. So that's the spin orbit splitting. Okay. So that, let's call it delta SO, spin orbit splitting. So again, I mean, this uh, I think we, we can we can make it more. I think there's also a two here. I'm just doing a hand wavy stuff right now. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Uh, so as, uh, as a result, uh, what happens is uh, you you have now two characteristic energies. You have the band gap and you have the spin orbit splitting. Yeah. Two two things now for for in the semiconductor. And it sort of happens that uh, on the top of the periodic table, you go to boron nitride, aluminum nitride diamond, silicon, or, or other compounds, you know, there the spin orbit is very weak because the z is very small. So there's not many nucleons, right? But as you go down, you start getting huge amounts of spin orbit splitting, and I think it doesn't take too much imagination to realize that at some point, spin orbit splitting is going to exceed the band gap of the material. So you actually split more than the band gap at some point. Right? And that happens around somewhere here, you know, between Germany, I mean, uh, indium antimonide is just at the verge where you start band gap becomes comparable to spin orbit and then you go down a little bit more and suddenly you are, you are uh, spin orbit is larger. And as a result, you start getting some very interesting uh, effects. Uh, you bands uh, uh, can invert, it goes into topological insulators and all these new uh, craze of wild metals, WEYL, and wild semi-metals and all kind of other things. But uh, the increasing spin orbit interaction is kind of interesting because you, you, there are potentials for ha harnessing the internal built in you know, relativistic magnetic field of materials. This is not a magnetic material, but if you do things right, you can actually harness this internal spin orbit magnetic field. 
not much has happened yet, but uh, I think there's quite a bit of potential in the future. Uh, so one of these examples is, uh, so we talked about GAN earlier, but let's look at the other end of the spectrum. This is gallium with bismuth. Bismuth is a uh, heavy metal. Uh, sorry, it's a heavy element. I mean, uh, don't want to call it a metal right now, but uh, so it's a heavy element. And uh, as a result, gallium bismide, uh, as you can see, gallium arsenide is a 3,5, gallium antimonide is 3,5, so is gallium bismide. It's also a 3,5 semiconductor, right? But whether it's a semiconductor, that's another question, because uh, uh, if you actually look at your lattice constant versus band gap, uh, or band gap versus lattice constant picture, let's say gallium arsenide is sitting here, then uh, um, what happens by the time you reach gallium bismide, gallium bismide is it has a negative band gap which means it's a it's actually a uh, you can call it a metal or a semi metal it's actually a, it's a negative band gap so band gap of gas is 1.4 electron volt it goes there and uh, um, but when you start adding small amounts of gallium bismide uh, bismuth into gallium right, you start kind of going down that route and you start shrinking the band gap of gallium uh, arsenide start shrinking. So. Uh, now, uh, this this has a large spin orbit interaction, but also by the time you add small amounts of bismuth into gallium arsenide, you start importing the crystal some amount of decent amount of spin orbit interaction. Gallium arsenide already has a, a decent amount, but you start adding more. You know, so, so. Uh, uh, now. Uh, so, uh, so that that's kind of a, uh, that's something being explored right now. And uh, uh, let me give you an example of of uh, uh, some, uh, uh, and it's a great example of this particular uh, study we did. Uh, people are trying to grow this material, and here's a paper from uh, about five, uh, seven years ago now, uh, 2008. Uh, so they're trying to grow uh, by MBE uh, and incorporate bismuth into arsenic into gallium arsenide. Uh, so while growing, they, they want to replace a certain fraction of arsenic with bismuth. So they're trying to go down this line. Right? And uh, so while they're growing, uh, what they're finding uh, is, is uh, it's kind of uh, interesting. So here's a, uh, after a lot of growths, here's some study. They've drawn a chart, which is the bismuth content. And what they're growing here is uh, uh, gallium arsenic with 1 minus x and bismuth with x. So x uh, 0 means it's gallium arsenide. And then you start adding a bit more. This is 4% bismuth, 8%, 12%, and so on. Right? Of arsenic's replaced with bismuth. And here's uh, uh, here, what they're changing. Uh, what they did was they are changing the flux uh, or the ratio of phosphorus. Meaning, on the on the left side you have very little bismuth, mostly arsenic. On the right side, so you're increasing the bismuth flux here. Right? You're increasing the bismuth flux. Uh, so in other words, you're marching in that direction with bismuth flux now, the pressure of, of bismuth. Right? And what they're starting to see is, is uh, let's say you sit at a certain temperature. This is a linear scale he here, but this is a log scale. But this is kind of one of those Langmuir isotherms, kind of. It's, so, so it's, it's kind of like that. Right? Yeah. Uh, and then as you start changing the temperature, you can kind of see this. Uh, if you were to stretch it out, make it linear, you'd probably be more clear. But uh, this thing starts moving to the left, and that's what will happen too. As you change the temperature, this will start moving to the right direction. Uh, now, uh, what they are able to do here is kind of uh, also uh, kind of nice. You can look at this curve, and you see that at low temperatures, you get a lot of bismuth in. And as you increase the temperature, you get less and less bismuth in. So as you increase the temperature, you're kind of walking down here. Uh, and uh, and they've come up with a very nice model here, which is essentially very similar to the, what we were talking earlier today. So there's a thermodynamic part to it, which tells you what is the you know, coverage uh, 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 at, at any uh, uh, temperature T, uh, what is the uh, coverage. And this is F, uh, uh, flux of bismuth, and this is flux of gallium, and X is the composition of, of uh, bismuth. Yeah. So I'm not going to talk too much. This is essentially a picture of the Langmuir isotherm. That's what this is. Mm -hmm. But the second one is kind of interesting because this is the kinetic part. Uh, kinetic part is, uh, so they look at it, they look at these curves, and they're able to figure out that, uh, look, uh, what, what am I trying to grow? I'm trying to grow. Uh, let me uh, you know, explain this uh, in, in, in a certain amount of detail. So you have gallium, arsenic, arsenic. 
and certain fraction of them are bismuths. Uh, arsenic, arsenic. So we are looking at a window which has 20% bismuth, for example, right? One out of five. So, and then uh, uh, through uh, their measurements, they are they see that actually they uh, they always have a bismuth over layer on the surface, meaning there is uh, there are bismuth atoms floating around which have adsorbed, but they have not yet incorporated in the crystal. So they are the, so you can sometimes called a wetting layer or a surfactant layer. So. Uh, and then it's floating around there. And now you also have uh, gallium, arsenic, and bismuth fluxes from the MBE sources. You know? So they have three sources. You have flux of gallium coming in, flux of uh, arsenic, and flux of bismuth all coming in at the same time. So they are not doing a modulated epitaxy. That all three sources are open at the same time. So they're growing in that. And then this whole thing sits at a certain temperature T. And, and so now uh, from uh, this, they're, they're able to uh, see that there are various possibilities of the growth of gallium arsenic and that's X bismide X. There are various possibilities. So the gallium can go in and uh, uh, so this, this thing is floating around. So you have a certain theta equilibrium, which is theta bismuth and that's yeah, and that. Right? So it's the equilibrium coverage. right? And then uh, the gallium atom comes in, and it can obviously uh, pretty easily uh, bond to the arsenic, right? So, so it will bond to the arsenic, uh, meaning it will, you know, essentially it will come in and form a chemical bond to the uh, arsenic here, and that is uh, has a certain lowering of energy once you form the chemical bond. There's a certain lowering of energy. If it were trying to bond to bismuth the lowering of energy would be much lower because the gallium bismuth bond is not as strong. Not as strong. So it actually doesn't want to do that. It doesn't want to go and bond to the bismuth at all. Right? It doesn't want to do that. So that's what they find out. Gallium to bismuth, there's no bond formation. It's not allowed. But how are you getting incorporation of bismuth into the crystal is kind of the interesting question, right? So the gallium bonds to the arsenic. If that keeps going on, then you'll only get gallium arsenic. You get no bismuth in the crystal, right? So, so then they figure out that uh, what is uh, uh, happening now is arsenic is coming in and uh, uh, it, it actually is able to uh, uh, so it, it, it actually is able to break so arsenic can come in and it can break or substitute the uh, chemical bond that has already formed between bismuth and, and, and uh, gallium so it can break it and the reason is uh, it has a certain potential hump to do that because this bond has already formed, but it, in the end it gains energy because that bond is stronger. Right? So uh, what, what actually happens now is, is uh, you see that both ways you're losing bismuth. I mean, bismuth will be get kicked out into this surfactant layer, right? But uh, what saves you is the moment gallium forms a bond to arsenic, this bismuth on top can form to bond to the gallium right away. And then that rate has to compete with the bismuth getting kicked out now. So there are two rates. One is, you know, the bismuth gets incorporated, and the other is bismuth gets kicked out. Right? And so the, that's what they are comparing here. There are two two rates going on, and you have a uh, so so the rate at which, for example, gallium starts uh, 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 displacing, uh, or rather, gallium comes in and forms a bond to arsenic is obviously proportional to the gallium flux, right? Because if you had no flux of gallium, there, this process cannot occur, right? And it is proportional to uh, uh, the uh, uh, so so. Just to be clear, what we are saying here is uh, it it actually displaces. We want to find out what's the rate at which the bismuth is incorporated. So we will only want to find out what arsenic uh, atoms here uh, are. So. Remember what we're saying is the gallium bonds to the uh, arsenic, but then a bismuth bonds to the gallium at the same time. So they're on the top. So it becomes gallium, arsenic, then gallium, and then bismuth. So that's what the bond structure looks like that. And the way bismuth can bond to that is if you have some bismuth in the first place. If you don't have any bismuth, you can't actually do that. So the surface, there's some bismuth floating around. So there's a theta bi, which is 
you know, the other proportionality term. And 1 minus x is actually how many sides there are, because there are x sides that already have bismuth, and 1 minus x is how many sides there are where you have arsenics, right? So that's a very nice way of looking at it, because now uh, you, the rate of change uh, of, of the bismuth content is this is how bismuth is getting into the crystal. Because gallium comes in uh, and, and bonds to arsenic, and then the bismuth that's floating on the surface immediately bonds to it. That gives you that, that. And th this is how many sites uh, of arsenic there are on the surface. That's, that's the rate at which uh, you are increasing the bismuth, and minus the rate at which you are losing bismuth. And I'm not going to write that out now, but you can see now the way you lose the bismuth is the arsenic comes in and kicks out this bismuth here. So that should be proportional to arsenic flux. And in order to do that, it has a certain activation energy, and this is the activation, e to the power minus that. And then x is how many bismuth atoms are there to kick out in the first place. So, so that's that. And there's a certain, because these two terms, uh, there are two terms, there's a certain, I mean, they might have some coefficients that are different, so you build in an A and say that at steady state, once you reach steady state, all of these are reached steady state, meaning for this point, they have a flux of this much and a temperature of that much, and they're growing for a certain time, and they take the sample out, measure, and they find the composition is close to 4%. So that's the steady state. Steady state means this and this, I mean, d by dt is zero. So, so the left, uh, so you get an equation, and from that equation you can find out what is x, right? In terms of all these other parameters, the nice thing about the other parameters is you can measure them. Right? So you can measure them through, uh, uh, through all kinds of stuff. Uh, for the theta, uh, the, the, this you get from here, from the Langmuir isotherm, from the thermodynamic part, okay? And that will give you x, and these dotted lines, are actually the plot of this equation, right? and then the, then the dots are, are, and the data points are there. So, so exactly, that is just the connection between what we talked about a little earlier and and uh, looking at the problem and specifically figuring out based on bond strengths, bond energies, and all that, what sort of uh, crystal will actually be most likely to form. Uh, so, so that's gallium uh, bismide uh, and bismuth based materials. Uh, so, uh, uh, I'll kind of end now by saying that. Uh, so, with gallium nitride, uh, uh, if we look at gallium arsenide, for example, we have seen it has 1.4 eV band gap. And if you start adding nitrogen and replacing arsenic with nitrogen, that's another very interesting uh, compound semiconductor. It's called a dilute nitride. So, you get gallium arsenide nitride. That's a dilute nitride. You see, now we are mixing group 5 elements. Earlier we were changing, you know, gallium or indium. We're now mixing group 5. So this uh, does actually something very interesting to the material. Uh, the nitrogen atoms, as you start introducing, what nitrogen does is it introduces a very, uh, you know, uh, 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 what's called a resonant state. The nitrogen energy is inside the band of, conduction band of gallium arsenide. So, so the, what it does is, is it takes the band structure of gallium arsenide and there's a resonant state and these nitrogen states interact extremely strongly with the arsenic states. And this is a, you know, it's kind of a very interesting uh, problem in quantum mechanics. What it does is it splits the band into two. It makes a lower band like that and this, uh, so this was your original band and then the upper one which will look like that. So it splits this band into two because of resonant state. Two, two bands, and there's a tiny gap between them, and so essentially this part goes away when you start adding dilute amounts of nitrogen, and you get this, this, and that. So the nitrogen attacks the conduction band edge of uh, gallium arsenide. Whereas if you start adding bismuth, which we were just talking about now, uh, so this is uh, called a b uh, resonant, nitrogen is a resonant state, and this model is called a band anti-crossing model that explains why you get a shrink of the band gap. Because you would have initially thought, look, if I go all the way and make it gallium nitride, I go from a gap of 1.4 eV to 3.4 eV. I should have increased in the band gap. But when people started adding a little bit of nitrogen, you see it actually shrinks, it decreases. And they, they figured out over the last you know, 10, 12 years now, or a little more now, that this is what's going on. Right? So, so in the, the state, uh, with bismuth, uh, uh, it also shrinks, but now uh, what, uh, and this is something people are still trying to kind of figure out completely, but I think there's a reasonable agreement now that with bismuth what happens is as you start adding small amounts of bismuth, there's also a resonance state like this, but not in the conduction band, now in the valence band. 
Bismuth is a heavy element. It always wants to attack. Basically, does all kinds of fun stuff to the valence band, you know, spin orbit splitting, and all that sort of thing. So it starts attacking the valence band, and therefore now you have splitting. Uh, you have band gap shrinkage, but now in the other way around, meaning from the valence band side, and you have a upper band here and a lower band here, and 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 so on. So it modifies the valence band in, a, in an interesting way, and it shrinks the gap. And both of these are kind of very useful if you can shrink the band gap of gallium arsenide, because gallium arsenide is uh, what powers much of the telecom today, telecom wave you know, lasers and all that, and uh, uh, the optical fibers through which our laser you know photons go through have a minimum of absorption at 1.55 micron. But unfortunately, 1.4 eV is not equal to 1.55 micron. You need to have a smaller band gap, so people use indium gallium arsenide, all these other things. But as you start adding indium gallium, in, a lot of indium to it, the crystal gets strained, and you have defects, you have you know, dislocations, and all that. People have figured out how to do good ones, but uh, good uh, you know, w solutions to it, but these are also potential solutions, because here you actually do not introduce maybe not too much strain, and you can still hit the 1.55 micron range. And so, so, so these are called dilute nitrides, and uh, uh, nitrides, and these are called dilute bis bismides, as a bismuth. And, and then these are being investigated uh, quite a bit. In fact, I think one or two companies had uh, products uh, based on the dilute nitrides, where you make the quantum wells made of dilute nitrides. So, so this is just another way to make a 3.5 uh, alloy, which are smaller band gap. The other way is obviously you go gallium arsenide, you go in indium gallium, where you change the metal, not the group five, but the metal, right? So that will be also a quantum well. This will also be a quantum well, right? Because it's a smaller gap. Uh, okay, so let's see. I think uh, 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 with that, I just want to kind of uh, finish off today by saying that uh, uh, we kind of got the uh, the coverage of the course, at least, was somewhat backward. Meaning, we started with uh, uh, you know uh, the the the, the uh, all sorts of quantum wells and DOS and electronic states. Talked about lasers, transistors in the beginning, which are kind of the end result of compound semiconductors. I mean, that that's what they help us make. And uh, and after that, we started looking at the materials per se, pro you know, into the electronic. Uh, properties, crystal structures, looking at uh, how uh, uh, they form alloys, right, and did delve into the material science part of it in the second half of the course. And uh, I don't know exactly whether the the weightages or rather the coverage uh, 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 was uh, uh, too much, too little, or something like that. Prob I mean, I think we covered quite a few topics in this course, uh, but this is indeed. Uh, uh, being taught for the first, at least I'm teaching it here for the first time. So, uh, you know, any sort of feedback from you guys would really help in in uh, uh, making the contents uh, 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 of the course maybe well better suited, or, or what, what did we miss? Uh, what were you expecting that we didn't see at all? Uh, were there some topics that we spent too much time on? Just let me know from feedback. It will be very helpful. And the, and the last thing I would like to say is uh, this uh, field, uh, as in any other field really, but uh, given its industrial, very strong industrial connection and importance, uh, it, it still is very vibrant and you know, booming, and there are a lot of uh, uh, kind of new things coming along. And uh, uh, as of today, uh, the, some of the biggest challenges uh, in, 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 in semiconductors, uh, semiconductors basically the the two or three major devices. There's the transistor, right, which does a lot of amazing things. It does logic, it does RF, amplification, communication, uh, uh, sensing, all kinds of things. Right? So, so, right? Then there's the laser and uh, light emitting diodes that do a lot of other things that we're very clear about now. Lasers do uh, power a lot of the communication, uh, optoelectronic communications nowadays a lot more, right? Uh, Maybe headlights soon. Uh, that's obviously a, a interesting situation. But uh, 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 LEDs uh, uh, quite a bit. But uh, uh, also the so in transistors, uh, you are always are looking for regimes you have not entered, right? So, so for example, we talked about uh, many of these compound semiconductors and wide band gaps are enabling transistors to switch at way higher voltages than people 
imagine could was possible and i think it hasn't stopped it's going to continue for the next decade or maybe more than that you can always end up underestimating how long things last things that work they last very long right um, and uh, so going into thousands of volts or so 10000 volts and all that and replacing many things nowadays that are done mechanically you know, switching of mechanical objects will re be replaced in the future by by some of these materials similarly for lasers uh, uh, so in transistors you can you can obviously make things faster too and faster uh, people have already reached we started the course by saying compound semiconductors have enabled close to a terahertz frequencies uh, now with indium for indium phosphide based hemp's and all that uh, similarly, uh, with nitrides, people are getting into very high frequencies and high voltages. Therefore, you combine them and you get a lot of power at, at high speed. That's enabling a lot of radar and maybe collision avoidance and, you know, these uh, automated cars and all will start using them. Uh, s uh, similarly, for low power logic, there are a lot of transistors that based on tunneling. A lot of three five uh, three fives are playing a decent role there, pretty good role. Uh, very low power transistors are based on interband tunneling, and uh, instead of going over barriers, you go through the barrier. And three fives are playing a major role there. Uh, on the other end, the spectrum. So lasers. Uh, obviously, we want to go to shorter wavelengths, uh, longer wavelengths. Quantum cascade lasers have done pretty well, uh, but in the shorter wavelengths, uh, the the shortest wavelength laser that electrically pumped semiconductor laser that is available today is still about 330, 335 nanometer. But you have the uh, possibility of going down to about 200 nanometer because of the wide band gap nitrides, for example. And so that remains a challenge. Uh, and then many people are trying to s address that. Uh, so I don't think we have that. Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, as you, for wide short wavelength optoelectronics, we're kind of looking at these materials. Many groups are looking at it. And it's a very hot and active area of research. And that area has many applications, not just making that laser based on aluminum nitride and those things, but uh, uh, if you have a good LED at those wavelengths, short wavelengths, you can make, you know, um, it's, it, it has very large markets for water purification, as an example. Uh, small, efficient LEDs uh, can enable, uh, there are large pop populations in the world that really do not have access to clean drinking water, uh, just like they didn't have access to light. Uh, in the night time. So with gallium nitride LEDs, uh, they now actually have a lot of tools where you can have the thing out in the sun in the morning and it has a little solar cell and a LED. So you actually, ha it has given uh, uh, that, that, that it has enabled lighting for many remote access areas or people who don't have access to a grid. Similarly, for drinking water and all that, this is uh, potentially going to be a very big uh, application So, in, in the deep UV. And obviously, uh, these are things that we are, uh, already know, uh, but uh, the most fun part will be people will be clever and figure out things that we haven't anticipated, uh, just like the laser headlight is a very interesting application to me, which nobody had anticipated, but now it's there, and uh, people are looking at that. So that's all about the applications, uh, but I think the most, uh, to me also, uh, um, the most exciting thing about the field is uh, uh, the science that comes out is, is really very beautiful and uh, interesting. Uh, I'll, I mean, there are many, many examples, but one of the examples I'll give is uh, the gallium arsenide based, uh, uh, so this, first the silicon transistor and then the gallium arsenide based HEMS, high electron mobility transistors, uh, led to the discovery of the quantum Hall effect and then the fractional quantum Hall effect. And that has given birth to this uh, whole new area now of, uh, you know, topological insulators and Majorana states and uh, all kinds of other th very interesting uh, aspects. And th that's a direct result of trying to make a good transistor. You know, that's what people are trying to do. And they hadn't anticipated it will give rise to a whole new field of physics uh, that came out of that. And, and as people start looking at what are people measuring, how can we explain it? You start, you start realizing a lot of things that uh, were not, well, people were measuring before, it's just they didn't, hadn't look, looked at them in that light. So that's the mo very exciting part of, of, of what uh, compound semiconductors enable and can let you do. Uh, from all your parts, you know, you can design devices based on their band structures and, you know, quant uh, design them quantum mechanically, give them any, any sort of designer potentials. You can create them and do all kinds of uh, studies with them. Uh, so, so that's uh, uh, that's the fundamental aspect of it. And has anybody read that article I posted by Joe Arthur, one of the 
inventors of MB or code developers. So I think he ends the article by saying uh, very nicely that, uh, and I, I completely agree with what he says there because I feel the same way, that I mean all this is really good and fun, you know applications are great, science is also great, but when you actually do the experiment in the lab and you see something happening, for example he says that they discovered read uh, in the lab uh, on a uh, basically an evening they were growing it, growing material in uh, early 80s and then they start seeing the you know start the the intensity starts pulsing as they grow in the reed and they had no idea what was going on and then uh, for about a year or so they told everybody that we observed this and it's repeatable and everybody else around this who was doing MB at that time start observing it uh, and then they re realized that they are really measuring each atomic layer depositing, you know, the oscillations. The, and that, that's how it was uh, figured out, right? And, and so uh, that is a very interesting thing. It's exciting because you see it uh, in the lab, right? And this is kind of the creation of materials one atomic, atomic layer at a time. You can actually measure it, control it. So that's very exciting, in, in, you know, beyond all the science and the applications. So, so. Okay, good. So uh, we can end it here today. And uh, uh, thank you again for uh, for you know staying with the course through the till the very end. And uh, you have your uh, dates for turning in your final thing, and we'll you know. Uh, uh, and I'm around. Actually, next week I'm around the whole week. So uh, and I'm around tomorrow too. If you have questions, uh, so feel free to stop by. Or, or yeah, thank you. All right. <coughs> Thank you.